Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today produced by Brandon Hall Group, The Future of Work, Immersive Learning Innovation. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are around the world watching this webinar today. We're excited to have you. Uh, we've got a great session with great panelists, we're going to be able to give you a lot of great information on this trend of immersive learning that we think is going to really dominate the learning environment over the next several years. First of all, let's give a thank you to our sponsor today, EI Powered by MPS. EI is an emotionally intelligent learning experience design company that partners with customers in their digital transformation journey. They have over three decades of experience in designing learning and performance support solutions that drive performance gain and maximize training ROI and ROE. They deliver high impact learning solutions that one, drive deeper and more meaningful learner engagement, enable effective upskilling and improve employee performance, create a high ROI for your organization. From strategy to development, to delivery, to measurement, they work with their customers to ensure training investments deliver business results. So I'm Claude Werder. I'm an analyst with Brandon Hall Group. I'll serve as your host today. Uh, before we get into our content, uh, let's uh, just go over uh, some, some preliminaries. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Brandon Hall Group, we're a human capital management research and advisory firm that empowers excellence in organizations around the world with our research and tools. Uh, a quick mention that we currently have several certification programs open for enrollment, including the Certified Learning Strategist Program. Visit certification.brandonhall.com to learn more about how do you earn that designation. Your participation in our research surveys is one of the most crucial components of our insights and thought leadership here at Brandon Hall Group. So if you have a few minutes to spare and see any topics that you can take a survey for, it would be greatly appreciated. As you can see, we have three surveys open right now, one in talent acquisition, future ready HR, and enabling elite performance. Links will be available in your uh, handout, or you can always just visit brandonhall.com. All participants receive a piece of complimentary research once the results are analyzed. And finally, a few logistics. We'd love to get your questions throughout the uh, webinar today. Please use the questions panel on your control bar. Uh, we'll leave time at the end for the questions. Webinar is being recorded and we'll share a link to the recording and a PDF for the presentation via email in roughly 24 hours, probably less. And if you would like to uh, download a copy of today's presentation instantly, a link to do so will be available uh, in the chat very shortly. The chat is open and we really hope you'll share your thoughts and experiences as we go along today. Your feedback and perspective on what we present and on your own experiences will make the webinar more valuable for everyone. So please join in today's discussion, share your thoughts as we go through, or just simply pop in, say hello, and let us know where you're uh, tuning in from today. So before we get started, just a quick poll for you. Uh, it won't take very long. We just want to get a sense of of your background and uh, you know where you're working in your organization. Are you in the corporate business function, corporate L&D function, corporate HR, academia, or some other type of, of school or educational institution? So we'll take a few seconds for you to click one of those buttons. It always helps us to understand our audience. Um, and so what your point of view might come from, your level of experience and, and your, uh, your breadth of experience. And so we like to have that information. So I, I think we've got what we need right now and we'll move on. So a quick session overview. Uh, first of all, we'll, we'll start with some introductions in just a minute of our great panel. Uh, then we'll give you a, a kind of a, the current landscape of the learning industry, where we stand here and as we stand in uh, October, 2023. Then we will have a, a panel forum on immersive learning and the modern learner. We'll, I think we'll have some great discussion there. Then we'll launch into talking about strategic immersive learning plans, as well as uh, talk about extended realities. And then we have uh, some demonstrations of how this works that we'll share with you uh, toward the end. So now, We've got a great panel here. I want to introduce them. First, we have Kelly Lake. 
Kelly is the Chief Strategy Officer for EI Powered by MPS. As a respected thought leader in the learning and performance industry, Kelly brings 30 years of global experience in learning and performance strategy, workforce enablement, learning and performance ecosystems, global performance transformation, immersive learning, and performance innovation. Welcome, Kelly. Joined by Erica Giraldo, who is a learning architect at Bombardier, the Canadian business jets manufacturer. She holds a master's degree in educational technology from Concordia University and several prof professional certifications. With a decade of experience as a university instructor and as an educational technologist, Erica has established a reputation for optimizing the learning experiences of adult learners across both the private and public educational institutions, as well as businesses. Welcome. And Michael Blattner, who's the head of Global Commercial Insurance Academy at Zurich Insurance Group. Michael's responsible for training and development activities for over 6,500 Zurich professionals working in commercial insurance across more than 30 countries. His expertise lies in enhancing core competencies and future skills, including insurance functions such as sales and distribution, underwriting services, and international program business. And so now I'll turn it over to Kelly to start us off with our learning industry landscape for 2023. Kelly. Thank you very much, Claude. I welcome all of you to the webinar today. I'm seeing everybody joining from across the world. So I appreciate uh, the uh, cross-cultural uh, input we're gonna get throughout this. And I'm very grateful for the um, panelists, Erica and Michael joining today. There's a tremendous amount of feedback and industry expertise that they will be sharing with you. So I'm very happy to be a part of today. So what I wanna talk about, just do a little bit more um, discussion uh, on what that landscape looks like. So Claude, if we can move to the next slide, please. So where we are currently, and exactly now that we're in October of 2023, you know, this is the time that a lot of learning leaders step back and say, okay, where are we from a trend perspective? What have we seen throughout this year? And during the validation period, are we on target to where we've thought we would be? Um, what changes have occurred throughout the year that we've had to adjust to? So that being said, you know, one of the, the biggest impacts that we've seen across, you know, and, and multiple verticals this year has been the impact of the talent shortage that we've had across the board. Now that talent shortage has hit every industry and the responsiveness back to that uh, shortage has really prompted organizations to take a look at how they're actually, you know, uh, looking at uh, attrition and um, skilling up their current employees, whether they're in the correct positions or not reskilling them and even cross skilling them. So these are just major impacts to engagement factors for learners across the industry and how are organizations really driving the impact of that and measuring performance outcomes. So this has been a, a big year for us, not only from, you know, that is a, the leading trend and we'll see, you know, the fallout from that, or which I call the learning disruption in our industry, but, you know, it's the involvement of all of the technology that we're looking at and where does that fit into our strategies we start to move forward. But again, you know, we're, we're talking about different types of um, extended realities as a result from, you know, having our learners, you know, being challenged to be engaged and making sure that organizations understand that within certain roles, you know, what do we do to be able to reskill them? Or there's multiple different approaches to being able to ensure that they have the skill set they need to produce val valuable and vital outputs from performance improvement to ensure that the company's hitting their organizational goals. Okay, next slide. So let's take that one step further. So as a result, from the engagement factor for organizations to take a look at how are we going to respond back to that. There are certain things that have emerged more aggressively this year than we've seen over the past. Some of those core areas tend to be around virtual reality. We're seeing more and more of that, not only from an improvement and measurability of using virtual reality, but how is an engagement factor? And it's been proven, you know, repeatedly that the engagement factor actually goes up. That's that's one aspect. So we're building out our ecosystem around that, you know, whole workforce uh, disruption so we can compensate for that. So we're seeing more of that as we're, we're looking at how we're building out, you know, our 
um, AI capabilities as well, too. So it's not just from the virtual side of it, whether it's, and we'll talk a little bit later on and show you examples of what that is um, and how we approach it from a very simplistic way to enter into that realm. But then also looking at the landscape expanding more. What does that look like when we're saying immersive learning? Looking at augmented reality, looking at, you know, virtual the same side or even mixed reality as we look at these different things. And you'll hear AI popping up and there's so many different things that are happening in the market right now around AI. But AI brings some benefits and some concerns as well. But some of those benefits really take a look at a learning delivery, taking a look at um, and identifying knowledge gaps, being able to have further insights into engagement. Um, even from that perspective, looking at, you know, uh, how an AI chatbot can work in, interactively with, you know, onboarding programs or your generative AI. So there's so many different approaches that are happening right now. I think that, you know, my recommendation back is to take a look and a step back at what these different technologies can do for your organization, wherever you are in your, your implementation strategy, whether you're just beginning, taking a look at this as well, or if you've done some, or if you're an expert in doing it, you know, we're going to give you some valuable insight to step back and say, okay, can we validate what you're doing? Maybe some best practices to take a look at this moving forward. And then also be able to leave you with, as Claude said, some takeouts that takeaways, excuse me, that there'll be links later on in the deck that we can share with you as well too. So we're, we're starting to see so much more of the, the immersive approaches to it. Um, also around the AI, I'll show you a quick little demo on um, interactivity between two avatars for role-playing. We have coaching platforms now that we're able to work more aggressively with. So there's benefits. And again, I will also talk to you a little bit more about how we're seeing those changes as we go through the rest of the the presentation today. Okay. So hopefully that gives you a good uh, step on where we are um, and understand how we're going to move forward with it. Okay. Great. Well, thank you for that, Kelly. And, and now uh, we've got a panelist forum uh, talking more about immersive learning uh, and getting different perspective. So Kelly, turn it back over to you. Thank you so much. So here's the exciting part of our webinar today. So I think um, we move to the next slide, Claude, please. I think it's important that with our experts on the call today, we get a chance to hear a little bit more specifically, you know, from their industry perspective, you know, their leadership perspective, and learn a little bit more about, you know, um, where we're going beyond the current part of the landscape right now. So you know, Erica, I'll start with you. Thank you so much for being a part of today. Um, I think that you know, if we could examine just a little bit, maybe some of the challenges that you're facing with your workforce today and, and share that with, with the participants on the call, that would be a great starting point, please. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Kelly and, and Michael and Claude and everybody uh, for, for being here with us today. So uh, on our end, uh, I think our challenges can be summarized in four points. The first one would be uh, our soon approaching retirements. Uh, almost 50% of our population in, in Quebec, uh, our company is, is headquartered in, in Quebec, 50% um, of our population will be retiring in the next five years. Uh, so most of these uh, retirees or soon to be retirees are long serving uh, blue collar workers. So it goes without saying that their experience and tacit knowledge acquired over years of hands on work will be really hard to replace. Um, another challenge is attracting new talent for technical roles within the aerospace industry in general. Uh, a significant concern, especially for the manufacturing uh, sector, is the projected uh, shortage of workers over the next 25 years. Since the year 2000, there has been a concerning decline in the number of people registering for technical programs with a drop of 49%. This decline has serious implications for Quebec in particular, which means that over the next uh, 25 years, uh, for every retiring employee, there will be only uh, 0 0.8 uh, new employees joining the, the, the labor market. Um, also, uh, there are some uh, vacancy concerns, of course. Uh, there are currently over 200,000 open positions, with a large chunk of these being technical roles. So uh, this significant number of vacancies indicate uh, there's a pressing need for a skilled uh, workforce. 
And finally, this three <laughs> brings us to the, the, uh, the, the main uh, challenge, which is the need for in-house training. Uh, given the scarcity of technical skills in the market, that data suggests that companies should invest in in-house training. And that this will be crucial for businesses to bridge the skill gap and ensure that uh, we have a team capable of meeting industry uh, demands. Now, Erica, thank you so much for sharing that. That's that's really interesting to see, especially from a geographic perspective as well, as we're we're looking at people what we're calling, you know, a little bit of what we're calling booming out or the boomers moving on to the next phase of their life and those skill sets that are needed on the knowledge transfer. So that's very, very realistic. And I think, you know, hearing from you and Michael gives those realistic details and what's up <laughs> today. So Erica, thank you for that. So Michael, same for you. I'll pose the same question to you and thank you again for being a part of this. You know, what what challenges are you currently facing? You know, you are, you know, a uh, Switzerland based organization, right? So would you mind just sharing some of those challenges with your workforce, please? Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> and hello, everyone. Hello from Switzerland. You mentioned it, Kelly. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Erica and Claude. Well, I think I could echo many of the things Erica just mentioned. Uh, it's not dissimilar, I think, in, in, in the rooms industry, uh, many of the, the points you, you mentioned before. I think I look at this question a bit differently, and I think our number one challenge we're still seeing, no matter what, is that at the times our learners feel that they don't have enough time to learn because they're so busy. So I think we're always a bit in competition with people's jobs, uh, even though I think nobody would deny that spending time on learning is very, very important. It's just a challenge that we have, and I'm pretty sure uh, we're not alone with that challenge. Um, but I would say that's maybe one of these challenges we're currently seeing. And the other one is maybe that learning is not always I would say accessible in the moment of need, um, which means that sometimes people will have to leave their working processes in order to get access to what it is they need to learn from. Uh, and that's not ideal. I think we have a bit of a way to go there. Uh, in particular, I think in, in, in our industry to kind of bring working and learning a bit closer together, I would say. Yeah. There you go. Excellent points, both of you. Thank you for that. So let's take that one step further and let's talk about, um, now that, that we're talked a little bit about the challenges, let's talk about how that's impacting performance income, uh, outcomes, excuse me. So Erica, if we would mind giving some of your insight on, on how it affects your performance outcomes, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. So, yeah, the challenges that I that, that I presented mostly, you know, retirements and the imminent workforce gap have uh, palpable repercussions on, on our performance uh, outcomes in, in our industry. So one of the main concerns, again, is the potential loss of quality and deep seated knowledge that the exiting generation has. As they retire, there's a pressing need to ensure that the new generation incoming is uh, equipped with the same caliber of skills and knowledge. So the approach we've taken is to be fully transparent, you know, uh, saying there are no miraculous solutions. Uh, we must uh, candidly acknowledge our current situation and recognize uh, that we have opportunities uh, to available to foster growth. So with this in mind, uh, and to mitigate uh, this challenge, oh, sorry, there was somebody, okay. <laughs> so uh, with this in mind, and to uh, try and mitigate these challenges uh, and their impact on performance outcomes, we have different proactive uh, strategies and approaches that we're trying to implement. The first one is technology integration. Uh, we're slowly and steadily introducing tablets and smart hubs to modernize processes and to make tasks more efficient. We're also collaborating with industry leaders uh, by exploring innovative solutions with companies like EI Design and other industry key players. We're trying to push boundaries and staying ahead of the curve. Uh, we're also engaging with educational institutions and government. There are concerted efforts uh, being made to attract, you know, the younger the younger generation to, to our industry. Uh, we are emphasizing, or trying to emphasize that the exciting technological facets of the industry in hopes to appeal to the tech savvy nature of today's uh, youth. 
And we're also, you know, continually learning and networking and staying updated, uh, going to conferences like this one or to, uh, you know, DevLearn, which is going to happen in Las Vegas very soon. We're trying to ensure that we're in sync with the latest industry trends and best practices. That's that's wonderful. I think those are really great, you know, uh, feedback for the people that are on the webinar today, just to hear what you're doing and how those, uh, you know, performance outcomes are effect being affected by, you know, your strategy moving forward. So then, Michael, from that perspective, you know, maybe you could share with us a little bit about how it's impacting your your outcomes, your performance outcomes. Please. Yeah, uh, of course. Uh, well, it's pretty obvious in a way, but if people think they can't take the time to learn and as a result, they don't learn, I think what we're seeing is just inconsistencies in performance. So, and we have some evidence there because we're also a business kind of who is auditing uh, ourselves uh, quite often and quite frequently. And I think as part of this type of audits, uh, sometimes that is kind of an impact we kind of observe that people have missed out on things or yeah, didn't know things. And then as a result, didn't do maybe what they were supposed to be doing or in the way they were supposed to be doing it. Uh, so I would say, yeah, pretty obvious, but I think there is a real impact which can result uh, in inconsistencies in the way we do we do our business. Absolutely. And I think, that, you know, again, this goes back to validation, you know, for the people that are listening in, having the same kind of challenges, right? And and looking at how to move forward uh, through these different challenges. So I think, you know, there are some answers that are in place that that are best practices that that are helpful, but there's also areas too of improvement that that we can further discuss to be able to provide that back. You know, one of those areas, you know, and I think this leads into the next my next question around seeing, you know, now that we've identified some of those gaps and validated against some trends and then talking about outcomes, you know, let's talk a little bit more in, about your particular feedback and views um, on immersive learning. So Erica, from your perspective, right? Um, and we're, what you've, uh, you know, been talking about today, do you, do you see the benefit of immersive learning for your workforce? Um, yes, uh, immersive learning, you know, has a great ability and potential to deeply engage learners and offer, you know, transformative uh, potential for our workforce. And uh, I would like to highlight a few critical considerations that must guide this, this, the, the application of this type of, of technologies and immersive learning. So the first one would be having a humor, a, a human centric approach. Um, because while technology, you know, is the cornerstone of immersive learning, uh, it is essential to remember that uh, this should be a tool to amplify the human experience and not to replace it, which is something that, that I see a lot in the debates, you know, now with AI and ChatGPT and all of these tools. Um, so uh, L&D professionals as well, uh, we play a, a crucial role beyond mere technologically, uh, technological proficiency. Uh, our expertise in pedagogy, instructional design, uh, learning theories, learner psychology ensures that learning is not just tech driven, but also purposeful, meaningful and impactful. And we must be wary of falling into the trap of using technology for its own sake. There is also uh, the need, in my opinion, to think about accessibility and inclusivity. Um, the true efficacy of immersive learning lies in its universal appeal. So we must design immersive learning experiences that are both accessible and inclusive, ensuring that everybody, regardless of their physical, cognitive, or sensory abilities, can benefit. So this approach uh, guarantees that learning is meaningful and resonates with diverse learners. Another consideration uh, has to be addressing demographic realities. Uh, our world is constantly evolving, uh, shaped by factors like migration, multilingualism, and career shifts. We're seeing more and more of that. Uh, so our immersive uh, learning solutions must uh, be adaptive and accommodating of these dynamic uh, realities. Um, and we, may, uh, we need to make sure that our content is, uh, you know, in multiple languages and in crafting learning modules for career uh, changers. Uh, and we need to make sure that our strategies reflect the multifaceted uh, nature of, of our global workforce. 
And finally, I think embracing UDL and EDI. So UDL would be universal design for learning and EDI, uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. As those, uh, those two have principles that should be at the heart of our, of our immersive learning designs. Um, these principles ensure that we, are, uh, we have learning environments and experiences that are uh, versatile and that uh, cater to the different needs of our diverse uh, learners. So in sum, that's, that's my, my, my view of, of the potential of uh, immersive learning. Thank you for your insights, Erica. I think that you raise some really good points that people can, uh, you know, uh, digest a little bit more and, and understand, you know, whether from, I always talk about, you know, the global transformation where we are, how we need to ensure that our, our um, solutions that we're, we're uh, creating are, you know, applicable across the board from a cultural perspective, from, you know, uh, complete submersion within different types of uh, geographies and, and the industries that we're talking about, because it's really important. And, you know, we think about our learners and, and how much they'll change their approach to learning, whether it's immersive or not. So those are really important factors that you raised, Erica. Good points. Thank you for that. And then, Michael, I'll pose the same thing to you. And if you would mind sharing some of your experiences of what you rolled out with immersive learning, I think that would be beneficial to hear. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you, Kelly. I think, I mean, first, first of all, I think everything we do that helps to drive learner engagement mm -hmm. helps, right? So if uh, going back to my perceived lack of time for learning uh, at the very beginning, if people can spare 45 minutes a week, let's make sure that they feel that it was time well spent, uh, that they truly learned from whatever they, they went through and it kind of sticks with them. Uh, and I think even more important, it really enables them to do things in a, in a different way. So it's not just about knowing stuff, it's also knowing how to do stuff because that's in the end, I think the ultimate goal uh, of what we're all trying to, I think achieve and accomplish in our capacities uh, being in the L&D space. Now, what I can share is maybe four examples where we use or used uh, immersive learning strategies already at Zurich. The first one goes back almost 10 years ago. Um, so it was back in the days where I think most of our learning uh, interventions were taking place in person. Uh, oftentimes, lecture type style. And uh, back uh, 10 years ago, we kind of felt that some of our people had a bit of fatigue, maybe with that particular lecture style, uh, lecture style type classroom training. Uh, hence, we kind of were thinking about creating something that is a bit different, uh, but we we're also in need to kind of teach our people a bit more the broader picture view, I would say, um, in terms of how they fit into the bigger picture of how we deliver to customers. Uh, we lost a little bit on that. So we decided to develop a board game and it was an in-person type board game uh, using a gamification strategy where people uh, kind of were grouped in teams and then were kind of going through an end-to-end -end customer experience together. Uh, rolling the dice and exciting stuff like that. Um, and I think it's fair to say that this became quite popular at Zurich. Thousands of people have gone through it. And uh, believe it or not, we're still using it and it is still popular. So I guess what I'm trying to say here as well is not all about digital. Uh, we learned uh, a board game where you can do an in-person kind of uh, event uh, or give people an experience can still be a, a very effective way for people to learn. The second example is a bit more recent, I think is about one year ago, where we uh, launched a 3D simulation. The, the idea there and maybe uh, the objective uh, of that 3D simulation really was to give people an opportunity to almost do a role swap. So see things from your colleagues point of view who you're working with maybe day in and day out, get a different perspective, go through somebody else's challenges uh, at work as and when they interact with you, so to speak. And I think a very effective way 
of in particular addressing behaviors, um, communication skills we found. And uh, when we measured kind of the outcome and the success uh, through repetition, because people can practice these three D same uh, on their own in front of their computer, so nobody is watching them, we're not recording anything. Because the aim is that they really learn uh, from the experience rather than anything else. And what we're seeing is that many people took that opportunity to repeat, repeat, and repeat again. And through this constant repetition, we were really able to close a significant skills gap that we found. So that was very, uh, I think, uh, useful way of learning for us. Very, very recently, and we're still working uh, on it, uh, is virtual reality. So here again, I think the use case is a bit different. So we are using virtual reality within our company right now to prepare people for side visits, customer side visits, where they can kind of practice in a safe environment using the virtual reality device, uh, kind of practice how they would approach certain situations as they were to go on site and talk to our customers uh, about certain stuff. I think. The one thing we found there, uh, which is very interesting, is the stickiness of the learning. That is absolutely fantastic. So I even myself, I used it months ago when we started with it, and I still can remember every single scene I went through. And if I compare that to some of the e-learnings I took very recently, uh, I can tell you that it's a remarkable difference, at least for me in terms of how I remember things. We did speak to many, many people about their experience and I think we got the same feedback and uh, outcome and result that people said something happens to your brain and I'm sure somebody on the call will have already started to study that stuff, I hope. And if so, please share me uh, your, share the, the findings with me. I'm, I'm super curious uh, uh, to learn more about it, but something happens to your brain and, and that means that you can by far better remember what you went through and then also be able to apply what you have learned uh, as a result. And then the other thing we just used actually, uh, thanks also to our partner from EY, um, Kelly on the call here, is uh, augmented reality. I think later in the presentation, you will see an example of what that could be looking like. Uh, but again, we used it uh, in the context of an in-person event, uh, really kind of, with the idea to do something for people so they can meet other people, new people they haven't met yet uh, from across uh, their business and doing something that is a bit of fun, a uh, bit of team building, uh, teamwork, doing a treasure hunt. Uh, in, in, in this case, it was throughout the city of Zurich, which uh, I think we had 150 people uh, joining. And, and I think the vast majority told us that they really enjoyed the experience. Uh, by all means. So just to name a few examples, but I would say these are the four I can really speak to because we have gone through uh, that experience uh, by now ourselves. Thank you, Michael. You raised some really good points. And I think, you know, having the experience, not only from how you've uh, moved your organization forward in different immersive learnings, it's also, you know, about the strategy and how you're going to do that, right? So uh, obviously, with the augmented um, reality, the the being able to be um, working with others and partnering and finding hotspots and and answering questions. I mean that that's very engaging in different aspects of it. But even from a virtual reality perspective, too, you know, we are inundated with stats on how effective you know virtual reality is across the board. And you know, I will tell you from vast experience that you know once you're able to roll out a type of virtual reality, whether it's completely submersive or virtual tour, like I'm going to show in a few minutes, it's important that, you know, from that experience, that's how you're going to measure your results and success with your, your particular um, employees and, and folks that are actually learning what they're going through. So I put the proof back into uh, what the demonstration is and what you're working on. So Excellent examples, Michael and, and Erica. I think I thank you both for sharing those points. I think it's resonating very well with, with the participants and also giving some insights. So I think, Claude, we can move to the next section, please. Wonderful. Yeah, so now uh, Kelly's going to share some strategic immersive, uh, some, you know, steps for uh, doing strategic immersive learning plans. And uh, 
using extended reality. So th this is great. Let's get into it. Okay, thank you. So let's take what we just heard from our experts and, and take that one step beyond, okay? So now that we have different experiences, um, where, like I keep saying, wherever you are in your immersive learning um, strategy, it's going to go back to updating your strategy from the beginning and things to think about that are outside a, a typical learning plan. So when we create this, there's the, the standard approaches that we've always used, you know, um, to ensure that we have engagement factors, ensure that we have, you know, return on investment or return on performance uh, identified as well. But some other things to think about, especially if you're just starting to embrace a little bit more about immersive learning, just things to think about and to work with your different teams within your organization. So I always recommend from the very beginning, you know, when you're going to look at your um, strategy, you know, do, do another assessment. I recommend quarterly assessments for validations, but it's really important to see, you know, your learners, um, you have new people coming in, new skill sets, take the time to do that. I think it's really important to understand how immersive learning is going to benefit you short term, long term, you know, and, and is the business ready for this, not only from a business case perspective, but also from a technical perspective. Um, making sure that you have costs in place and that you are able to effectively, you know, implement across the board. Um, so these are like, as part of your assessment, take the time to take a look at that. And then as you're going through the planning stage or what I call the ideation stage, really understand how the business is going to respond. Is the workforce, you know, flexible enough or ready enough to be able to do that? Um, you know, I always talk about scalability and sustainability because it's so important where you are today. How are you going to grow? What is your growth model um, based upon including your employees, your learners, the culture of your organization, you know, your different types of business models? Um, look at that. Spend some time with stakeholders. Educate your stakeholders across the board on what this means. What is the benefit to the organization? Um, and provide case studies for them or, or examples so they can uh, apply it. Um, in a better readily way. So when you're looking for your champions out there uh, in your organization, they're prepared, they understand what's going on. Also take the time for a deeper relationship with technology or your technology groups. This is very important. Understand across the board, you know, uh, what the different types, like for an example, virtual reality, what that would look like for them to understand, you know, what equipment is required? Are you going to do something with a submersive, you know, headset? Are you going to just do um, a web-based? So they're prepared. They understand a little bit more. Um, you can actually work with them on any equipment, anything that's required, you know, substantially across the board. The planning part of it's really important because as we take a look at extended reality and, and uh, equipment around that, it gets a little bit um, cost prohibitive at some times if you're going full on. So you have to plan that very effectively. And then a really important point, and I'm sure that everybody, um, you know, understands the data privacy around it. So you work in a partnership, you work with a partnership with IT. I would also take a look at working, you know, with your legal team too. So everybody is aware of what's going on because there's not necessarily one point of, in, within an organization that's responsible for it. So you have to build that shared knowledge and that shared responsibility as you start to move forward. Cause a lot of that sits, you know, with, with learning and development leaders to, to push this. Um, so take the time, partner, explain, and get everybody on board to what you need to do so you have a full impact of it as well too. Also, if you're just starting out or even if you want to validate your specific um, strategy, engage with an, with an outside expert. There, there are so many different organizations that can help you from a high level perspective, validate what you're doing and also shared lessons learned. Um, because there, we're still going through this process on different levels, whether it's a level one where you're doing something. A lot of the questions come back to me. What's the easiest way to get into immersive learning? It could be something as simple as augmented reality, where you're bringing um, specific uh, material to life. Um, something as easy as that where the cost is not so high, but the entry point is pretty, pretty simplistic to move into. But take the time, get the feedback, see what other companies have done as well. And this is really important. As you start to build out your extended strategy, go back and revisit it. You know, take those quarterly times to say, are we on target? You know, where we are with technology? You know, where are we from scalability perspective? These points will definitely help you move forward. Okay, so I think we're ready to get, to get in some uh, demos now and some demonstrations of how this works.
Perfect. So the first demo that we're going to go through is a little bit on virtual reality. Um, and wanted to show you some of the types of the virtual realities that we've created and give you some examples that really will provide some more insights. So this first um, example, we actually built um, for a tour. And this is a VR tour based on images, you know, photo images realistically, but it's a tour that you're able to scan and go through. This is a campus that was developed, interact with different um, learning objects, navigate through the floor, be able to, if you see on the top left-hand side, there's actually a floor plan that you're able to engage with. We have built-in videos within this too and avatars that can respond as part of the learning process as well. So it gives you a more of an immersive feeling. Um, and this was designed specifically for our, one of our customers that were challenged with being able to do that. Now there's an example of how to provide a virtual um, walkthrough for customer service agents. Um, how to respond back. You can have um, specific modes in here that you're looking at the devices, you're hearing back um, from the specific um, audio and virtual um, uh, videos as well in this. The nice thing about it is that there's a practice mode also that you can do in a very safe environment. This particular um, is more of an immersive perspective and uh, being able to examine uh, from the World Health Organization um, interactivity with learning objects to prevent risk and safety um, issues that occur. It allows you to continue through and walk through, but you're able to engage with the particular learning objects. So again, it's whether it's a tour or whether it's immersive, um, whether we're creating this from photorealistic or we're doing 3D imaging across the board, it gives you a sense of what's happening. And the next um, example that we will share with you is a little bit more from an AI perspective. So I talked a little bit earlier about um, avatars are great, um, but what can you do outside of a basic avatar speaking with you or embedded within your learning? This will give you an example of a role playing that we created for a client to show you the extent Hello. of being having a Nice scenario. to meet you. My name is Tina and I also work at Swisscom, but in the virtual world. Click on start and our conversational adventure begins. Here we go. Hello, Mr. Miller. What can I do for you? Hi. I received an email about MyCloud. You write that my MyCloud subscription will be adjusted. Why do I suddenly have to pay for my subscription? You have been informed about our new offer. I would be happy to look at it in detail with you. So this enables the learner to choose the path because it's scenario based, based upon the response. And as you select your specific uh, scenario, the avatars are programmed the to... The subscription for 10 Swiss francs was recommended to me. I know it's not that expensive, but I'm not willing to pay for something that was free before. I understand you. And at first glance, I would react the same way. So from this point, again, you're doing a scenario base. But the great thing is that this is programmable in regards to the script that you're using for the avatars and we create the avatars for you specifically. So it gives you a sense of what you can do from an AI role-playing perspective. And just as a, a next step, what we did too, and this is just a takeaway for everybody. And if you scan on the code there, we've created uh, an avatar. Her name is Emma. Emma is actually provides interactivity for you and gives you some insight into AR, VR and immersive learning. So this again is just a, a avatar that we created that you can use yourself and see the, the value add of being able to have that, that immersed kind of interactivity with it. So I highlight and refer back to everybody that, you know, when you have the time, we'll be giving you the, the handouts as well too, but do scan the code. It's kind of fun to work with Emma and it shows you some examples of what you can do at a very small scale to interact with some of your learners. Okay, okay now we can uh, move into some questions. We've got a lot of comments that have uh, come in uh, as well as some questions. Um, let's see, let's take a look here. Um, so, um, what's the best place to start? Kelly, let's, uh, let's go to you first and just uh, going back to 
the learning strategy regarding immersive learning. So how do you know it's kind of on the right track and what should we consider about AI in, in planning? Certainly. So th those are two, two points in, in one. So let's take it from how do we know if we're on the right track with our strategy? So I think the very first thing, um, if your, your strategy has been rolled out and you've included um, uh, approaches for immersive learning, what I would do is validate it, right? So um, are you hitting your particular targets that you have identified? Are you doing it you know, successfully with the different methodologies or approaches that you have in place? Because you can always adjust as you go through that. And I think when you start to think about AI, there's different ways to include AI within your strategy that are not going to be cost effective, you know, heavily. Um, there's entry points, like I mentioned before, but it's also knowing where your learners are, what, you know, what they're willing to respond to. So I highly recommend doing a, even a, a specific, if you haven't done it before, a pilot back into it and work with your learners to get them, you know, how are they responding back to, to, you know, something as simple as like doing the avatars? Is it disruptive for them? Is it inclusive for them? Is it encouraging them to be more engaging as well? So there are some some points that I can share post the webinar to, to bring you on track to say, here's some validation points as you go through that. Okay. So we have a, a few other questions coming in here. So one is, if you could talk a little bit about the, the apps and, and, and the technology that's used to create these, these kind of demos, these kind of uh, experiences. Absolutely. So, so what, how we create these are, are on, and I'll put it into two categories, right? So they're not apps. So what it is, is depending on the requirements from um, our customers, whether it will be a tour, a virtual tour, which we will do from a photography perspective, we go in, we capture, like for an example, um, going to a site, capturing, you know, what the building looks like, the different approaches to the building. And that's just the essence of it, right? It's the learning journey, which is the most important thing. How are we experiencing? How are the learners going to experience the journey across? And then being able to build it out, creating it either with a photo, imaging around it, or if we're actually doing 3D scanning. So there's different approaches depending on the type of immersiveness that, that you want to target. So we've got a couple of questions here. Um, we're getting questions both in the chat and in the question uh, areas, but uh, about the measurement of interactive learning. How do you go about measuring the impact and, and the results? Sure. Would you like me to address that, Colin? Sure. Sure. Go ahead. I don't want to. I don't want to rule you out in uh, answering some of the questions. No. Uh, at measuring um, immersive learning. There's several different approaches to doing that, and it's how your organization defines it. So I really push return on performance because that's where your measurement, obviously you can do it from an ROI perspective, but with the technology where you are in your investment, it's easier to prove performance improvement as we look across this. So it's not only, so if you look at how you're approaching your standard e-learning or areas within this, you're actually, your engagement factor is higher. Um, and your response rates should also be higher when you're looking at that. So as Michael had mentioned before, you know, something happens from a, an engagement perspective as you're using like a virtual reality or something else like that. So it's important that there are there's a scale of measurement for immersive learning that not only is from, you know, uh, AR has been, you know, is available in the VR. We're actually working with strategy with organizations right now to be able to provide that benefit. So please do reach out and I'd be more than happy to share those details with you. Thank you. We also had a question earlier that we should probably uh, address a little bit. And that is, um, you said it toward the beginning that the the impact and the, uh, the importance of VR has been cited over and over again in research. And uh, somebody mentioned that they'd only seen really one study that that said that. So I can add a little bit to that. I mean, there, there actually are a lot of studies that is the one that tends to get cited the most, but uh, we've studied it. Uh, other research firms have studied it. Uh, higher education institutions have studied it. Uh, and it VR is very effective. This immersive learning that we're talking about it is much more effective than the more traditional uh, learning methods. Um, I think one of the things that has hampered some of the effectiveness data is especially in the last, over the last few years, uh, was relatively low use. And so when people did uh, effectiveness uh, questions in their research, the effectiveness on VR and, and AR was, you know, relatively low. 
Um, but as more people have used it and they've gotten more experience, the effectiveness rates have gone way up. So that when we asked about modalities for learning effectiveness, and I don't have the data in front of me, but we, we asked about different modality effectiveness and VR and AR was, you know, I think second or third on, on the list compared to toward the very bottom two or three years ago before people had gotten a lot of experience with this and been able to access it. So this is definitely effective. It's going to get more effective as people get more familiar with it and, and more, more use. Anything anybody wants to add to that? No, completely see that. And especially with um, more usability, Glad, I think you're, you know, from what you're hearing and with working with all our customers across the board, the more use and, and also the enablement of what does effective measurement really mean. I think that that's just going to see more and more um, reports shared out across the industry. And, and like when we, we do our research and, and talk to different people, we're seeing those stats being posted. So I think you make a really great point. Thank you for that. Sure. We have a, we'll just keep moving through some of these. Um, we have a question from Vince about addressing both linguistic and cultural differences when creating avatars. Mm. Anybody have? That's a very important that? point. Yeah, it, yeah. it is. Very important point, because as we're seeing, there's probably about six vendors out there right now that, that do these, you know, more of the canned uh, avatars. And there's challenges, obviously, as we were all seeing, you know, with syncing and, you know, um, not having dialectical uh, levels to the point that they need um, to really reflect a lot of the learners. So I think we're we're still at a level one uh, in that rollout, unless you're doing a custom approach on that. And that's like, you know, what we do is a little bit more specifically, exactly um, on the cultural side of it, the fit for the cultural understanding of what fits with the organization and what's readily available. So um, there are some new avatars that have been released uh, lately that that are a little bit closer to where we want to be within the industry as well. But I would highly recommend as well to to take a look at doing a custom one. So it is an alignment from a cultural perspective and from a linguistic because it's really important that organizations, especially from a global, have that level of um, authenticity for them. Let's go to uh, a, a question uh, for uh, Michael now. Um, Michael, you spoke about best practices and what do you think is the quickest way to start immersive learning within an organization? What's the best way to get started? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, I think one advice I would give to myself all the time is be very clear on the use case and on the why. Because uh, I think it was mentioned, these things can become, don't have to, but can become quite costly uh, relatively soon. But that in itself is not a problem if the benefits are there and the use case is is there and this is waterproof. And uh, I think then it's it's not so much a matter of, of the investment as such uh, because there is an outcome. Uh, but I think number one advice, be very, very clear on it. Don't, don't try to do it for the sake of trying to be modern or playful. At least uh, that's how we think about it. So... Number one, number two, I think when we started to kind of work with virtual reality, the first thing we did is actually work with our leadership team. And I think Kelly, you uh, alluded to it uh, as well, that it's extremely important to bring leaders behind you and your use case and kind of the experiments you want to go through uh, using uh, newer technology. Uh, so in our case, that was really kind of... Uh, uh, I think one of the most important steps for us to proceed any further is kind of getting the engagement and the buy-in from, from our leaders. Yeah, this is Claude. I, I would add to that. I think absolutely I agree the leadership buy-in is important. There was a comment earlier uh, in the presentation too about uh, the necessary mindset of learners. We talked about my, learners saying, you know, this is, you know, I'm too busy for learning. So the leadership um, buy-in is important to communicate to learners that that they should change their mindset. In other words, if the message in the organization is they're getting the message that they're too busy for learning, learn, leaders can help change that mindset because to be able to really take advantage of this immersive learning, the learners, the employees need to believe that it's okay for them 
and enc they're encouraged to take the time to learn. So the leadership and, and the uh, mindset change of, of learners go hand in hand. Very, very important that those two work together. Any, any other thoughts on that? I'm kind of scrolling through the chat and um, questions to see new things. So um, let's see. One was, Oh, uh, just to follow up from Kate, she would like us to share sources of research. I, we can uh, we can share that offline with you, Kate. We can give you some some sources. Uh, let me go to the chat here. There was an also um, some questions, a few different questions about uh, the cost and also the uh, the cost of the technology. And is there a lower entry point than just the most expensive and and sophisticated AI and VR technology? Kelly, is that something you can take? Absolutely. And, and I alluded to this a little bit before because um, it, yeah. the number one question that we always hear back is, how, where's an easy entry point? And, and I go back to, to the um, augmented reality part of it because it's easier to get through something like that and getting stakeholders to buy off on it um, because it's easier for them to understand. And your price points are you know, pretty comparable um, if you're doing something along those lines to like a level three um, e-learning. Um, so it's not high, it's, it's very manageable. And then it's also sustainable and reusable. So those things are really important as well. You can also do, you know, another thing like a virtual uh, tour, which is not heavily in invasive and, or even expensive. It's just a matter of where your, your touch point is and what solution will apply to you more. So we, we can have an off, you know, let me know, we'll can have an off, uh, um, and I'll com conversation post this and, and I could probably provide you with some pricing that that would be a good entry point and some of those solutions that you may want to take a look at. Okay, thank you. Got uh, probably just time for a couple more. Um, got a couple of questions related to the amount of time that needs to be allocated for this type of learning. Uh, so one person said it is three hours enough or, you know, so I think the real question is how do you determine uh, the amount of time that you need for these types of immersive experiences. Who would like to take that? I can kick off and Michael, please add to it um, from your experience as well too. So I think that the time invested relates back to the experience that you want your learners to have, whether it's based on you know product um, or sales or depending on which type of learning, even leadership learning for an example, um, the time invested into it should be pretty much in correlation with what you're doing right now, but the outcomes, you know, should be measured a little bit more substantially to show that, uh, and then eventually what will happen is the time invested will go down as opposed to the, the traditional kind of learning that you're doing now. And you'll see more of a return on performance due to, you know, having a shorter period for engagement. Uh, Michael, if you have any follow-up from your experience on that. Yeah. I mean, I was just going through my examples and, um, starting maybe with a board game. I mean, this one lasts for about three hours, but nobody complained so far to the, to the country. As people immerse into the experience, they don't want to stop. So we sometimes have to stop right. them to say it's over. So I think that's maybe the best case scenario, right? Uh, with virtual reality, our experience is a bit that having these things kind of, you know, carried around on your head. And given that, I think we're not so used to this yet, at least I'm not. I think limits a bit the amount of time you should spend uh, with uh, kind of uh, wearing these uh, devices. And on the simulation, we just decided from the very beginning that we're very, very focused. So it shouldn't take longer than 45 minutes. Now in reality, if you go through the happy path, that's 45 minutes. If you go and have to repeat or will be wanting to repeat uh, things uh, all over again, might be two to three hours, so it's extremely hard to answer. It depends, I guess, is the answer. Yeah, there you go. But the intention is to reduce the time and and get to the point where you know you're engaging in in a much profound, more profound way in a shorter period of time, you know, to prove the engagement factor. So I think that we can take best practices from that. Well, we we've got a couple of other comments coming in, but I think we're going to have to hold it there. Maybe we can respond to those offline. Uh, want to thank everyone 
for participating, our panelists, Kelly, Michael, and Erica, uh, but also all of your comments and the time that you've invested in this and, and your, your thoughtfulness throughout has been great. Uh, we want to offer you a, a couple of uh, uh, handouts uh, to that can uh, expound on what we've been talking about a little bit today. We have an ebook called Imagine Experience Connect, um, and you can download that uh, from your deck. There's a link. And then a research brief called The Importance of Emotional Intelligence in the Age of AI. So two great handouts uh, that AI is leaving you with. And then uh, just wrapping up with, here's some contact information at, at the end of your deck. Uh, you can uh, contact EI at sales at design dot, uh, EI design dot net or engage at EI design dot net. And of course, uh, there's their website that you can access as well. We want to uh, bid everyone a great rest of your day. Thank you for your participation. Thanks to EI again for sponsoring. And we look forward to seeing uh, people in another Brandon Hall Group webinar real soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.